Okay, welcome back to SuperCloud 22. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We have Ali Gatsi here, co-founder and CEO of Databricks. Ali, great to see you. Thanks for spending your valuable time to come on and talk about SuperCloud and the future of all the structural change that's happening in cloud computing. My pleasure, thanks for having me. Well, first of all, congratulations. We've been talking for many, many years and I still go back to the video that we have an archive of you talking about cloud and, and really at the beginning of the big reboot I call the post Hadoop, you know, uh, 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 revitalization of data. Congratulations, you've been cloud first, now on multiple clouds. Congratulations to you and your team for achieving what looks like a billion dollars in annualized revenue as reported by the Wall Street Journal. So, th so first, congratulations. Thank you so much, appreciate it. So I was talking to some young developers in the, and I, want, I asked a random poll, what do you think about Databricks? Oh, we love those guys, they're AI and ML native, and that's their advantage over the competition. So <laughs> I pressed why. I don't think they knew why, but that, that's an interesting perspective, this idea of cloud native, AI, ML native, ML ops. This has been a big trend and it's continuing. This is a big part of how this change and the structural change is happening. H how do you react to that? And how do you see Databricks evolving into this new super cloud-like multi-cloud environment? Yeah, look, I, th I think it's a continuum. It starts with having data, but they want to get the, clean it. You know, they want to get the insights out of it. But then eventually you'd like to start asking questions, doing reports, maybe ask questions about what was my revenue yesterday, last week. But soon you want to start using the crystal ball, predictive technology of, okay, but what will my revenue be next week, next quarter, who's going to churn? And if you can finally automate that completely so that you can act on the predictions, right? So this credit card that got swiped, the AI thinks it's fraud, we're going to deny it. That's when you get real value. So we're trying to help all these organizations move through this data AI maturity curve all the way to that, you know, the prescriptive, automated AI machine learning, that's when you get real competitive advantage. And you know, we saw that with the FANGs, right? I mean, Google wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for AI. You know, we'd be using Alta Vista or something. Uh, you know, we want to help all organizations to be able to leverage data and AI that way that the FANGs did. One of the things we're looking at with SuperCloud and why we call it SuperCloud versus other things like multi-cloud is that today a lot of the successful companies have started in the cloud, have been successful, but have realized, and even enterprises who have gotten by accident kind of, and maybe have done nothing uh, with cloud, have just some cloud projects on multiple clouds. So people have multiple cloud operational things going on, but it hasn't necessarily been a strategy per se. It's been more of kind of a, a default reaction to things. But the ones that are innovating have been successful in one native cloud because the use cases that drove that got scale, got value, and then they're making that super by bringing it on premise, putting in a modern data stack for the modern application development and kind of dealing with the things that you guys are in the middle of with Databricks is that that is where the action is. And they don't want to go lose the trajectory and all the economies of scale. So we're seeing another structural change where the evolutionary nature of the cloud has solved a bunch of use cases, but now other use cases are emerging. That's on premises and edge that have been driven by applications because of the developer boom that's happening. You guys are in the middle of it. What is happening with this structural change? Um, are people looking for the modern data stack? Are they looking for more AI, what's, the, what's your perspective on this super cloud kind of position? Yeah, look, it started with now they are on multiple clouds, right? So multi-cloud has been a thing, it became a thing. 70, 80% of our customers, when you ask them, they're on more than one cloud. But then soon they start realizing that, hey, uh, you know, if I'm on multiple clouds, this data stuff is hard enough as it is. Do I want to redo it again and again with different proprietary technologies, you know, on each of the clouds? And that's when I start thinking about, let's standardize this, let's figure out a way which just works across them. That's where I think open source comes in, becomes really important. Hey, can we leverage open standards? Because then we can make it work in these different environments, as you said, so that we can actually go super, as you said. Uh, that's one. Uh, the second thing is, can we simplify it? You know, and I think today, uh, the data landscape is complicated. You, you know, the, conceptually it's simple. You have data, which is essentially customer data that you have, maybe employee data, and you want to get some kind of insights from that. But how you do that is very complicated. Today. You have to buy a data warehouse, hire data analysts. You have to buy, you know, store stuff in the data lake, you know, get your data engineers. If you want a streaming, real-time thing, that's another complete different set of technologies you have to buy. And then you have to stitch all these together and you have to do it again and again on every cloud. So they just want simplification. So that's why we're big believers in this data lake house concept, which is an open standard to simplifying this data stack and help people to just get value out of their data. 
in any environment. So they can do that in this sort of super cloud, as you call it. You know, we've been talking about that in previous interviews, do the heavy lifting, let them get the value. I have to ask you about how you see that going forward, because if I'm a customer, I have a lot of operational challenges because the developers are, are kicking butt right now. We see that clearly. Open source is growing at, at, and continue to be great. But ops and security teams, they really care about this stuff. And, and most uh, companies don't want to spin up multiple ops teams to deal with different stacks. This is, this is one big problem that I think it's, that, that's leading into the multi-cloud viability. How do you guys deal with that? How do you talk to customers when they say, I want to have less complications on operations? Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, it's easy for a developer to adopt all these technologies and new things are coming out all the time. The ops teams are the ones that have to make sure this works. Doing that in multiple different environments is super hard, especially when there's a proprietary stack in each environment that's different. So they just want standardization. They want open source, that's super important. We hear that all the time from them. They want open source technologies. They believe in the, believe in the communities around it. You know, they know that source code is open, so you can also see if there's you know issues with it, if there's security breaches, those kind of things that they can have a community around it so they can actually leverage that. So they're the ones that are really pushing this and we're seeing it across the board. You know, it starts first with the digital natives, you know, the companies that are, but slowly it's also now percolating to the other organizations that we're hearing across the board. Where are we, Ali, on the innovation strategies for customers? Where are they on the trajectory um, around how they're building out their teams? How are they looking at the open source? How are they extending the value proposition of Databricks and data at scale as they start to build out their teams and operations? Because some are like kind of starting, you know, crawl, walk, run kind of vibe. Some are big companies, they're dealing with data all the time. Where are they in their journey? What's the core issues that they're solving? What are, what are, the, what are some of the use cases that you see that are most pressing? Uh, in yeah, the what I've seen that's really exciting about this data lakehouse concept is that we're now seeing a lot of use cases around real time. So real time fraud detection. Real-time stock, ticker, pricing, anyone that's doing trading, they want that to work real-time. Lots of use cases around that. Uh, lots of use cases around how do we in real-time drive more uh, engagement on our web assets if we're a media company, right? We have all these assets. How do we get people to get engaged, stay on our sites, continue engaging with the material we have? Those are real-time use cases. And the interesting thing is they're real-time. So, uh, you know, it's really important that you do that now. You don't want to recommend someone, hey, you should go check out this restaurant if they just came from that restaurant, you know, half an hour ago. So you want it to be real time, but B, that it's also all based on machine learning. These are, a lot of this is trying to predict what you want to see, what you want to do, is it fraudulent? And that's also interesting because basically more and more machine learning is coming in. So that's super exciting to see the combination of real time and machine learning on the lake house. And finally, I would say the lake house is really important for this because that's where the data is flowing in. If they have to take that data that's flowing into the lake and actually copy it into a separate warehouse, that delays the real-time use cases, and then they can't hit those real-time deadlines. So that's another catalyst for this lake house pattern. It was, would that be an example of how the metrics are changing? Because I've been looking at some, some people saying, well, if, if the, you can tell if someone's doing well, there's a lot of data being transferred. And I was saying, well, wait a minute, data transfer costs money, right? <laughs> and time. So this is interesting dynamic. In a way, you don't want to have a lot of movement, right? Yeah, movement actually decreases for a lot of these real-time use cases, because what we saw in the past was that they would run a batch processing to process all the data. So once they process all the data, but actually if you look at the things that have changed since the data that we have yesterday, it's actually not that much. So if you can actually incrementally process it in real time, you can actually reduce the cost of transfers and storage and processing. So that's actually a great point. That's also one of the main things that we're seeing with the use cases, you know, the bill shrinks and the cost goes down and they can process less. Yeah, I'm just going to see how those KPIs evolve into industry metrics down the road around the super cloud of evolution. I got to ask you about the open source concept of data platforms. You guys have been a pioneer in there doing great work, um, kind of picking the baton off where the Hadoop world left off as Dave Vellante always points out. But working across clouds is super important. How are you guys looking at the ability to work across the different clouds with Databricks? Are you going to build that abstraction yourself? Does data sharing and model sharing kind of come into play there? How do you see that? This, this Databricks capability across the clouds? Yeah, I mean, let me start by saying we just, we're just we big fans of open source. We think that open source is a force in software that's going to continue for you know decades, hundreds of years, and it's going to slowly replace all proprietary code in its way. 
we saw that you know it could do that with the most advanced technology windows you know uh, proprietary operating system very complicated got replaced with linux so open source can pretty much do anything and what we're seeing with the data lake house is that slowly the open source community is building a replacement for the proprietary data warehouse you know data lake machine learning real time stack in open source and we're excited to be part of it for us Delta Lake is a very important project that really helps you standardize how you lay out your data in the cloud. And with it comes a really important protocol called Delta Sharing that enables you in an open way, actually for the first time ever, share large data sets between organizations, uh, but it uses an open protocol. So the great thing about that is you don't need to be a Databricks customer. You don't need to even like Databricks. You just need to use this open source project and you can now securely share data sets between organizations across clouds and it actually does so really efficiently. Just one copy of the data, so you don't have to copy it if you're within the same cloud. So you're playing the long game on open source. Absolutely. I mean, this is a force. It's going to be there. If you know, if if if, if you deny it, <laughs> before you know it, yeah. there's going to be you know something like Linux. Uh, uh -huh. You know that uh, is going to be a threat to your yeah. proprietary. I totally stuff. agree. By the way, I was just on someone the other day. I'm like, hey, you know, the software industry. Someone made a comment about the software industry. The software industry is open source. There's no more software industry. It's called open source. It's integrations that become interesting. And I was looking at integrations now is really where the action is. And uh, we had a panel uh, with the Clouderati, we called it, the people have been around for a long time. And it was, it was called the innovator's dilemma. And, and one of the comments was, it's the integrator's dilemma, not the innovator's dilemma. And this is a big part of this piece of super cloud. Can you share your thoughts on how cloud and integration need to be tightened up to really make it super? Actually, that's a great point. I think the beauty of this is, look, the ecosystem of data today is vast. You know, there's this picture that someone puts together every year of all the different vendors and how they relate, and it gets bigger and bigger and messy and messier. So, you know, we see customers use all kinds of different as you know, aspects of what's existing in the ecosystem, and they want it to be integrated in whatever you're selling them. And that's where I think the power of open source comes in. Open source, you get integrations that people will do without you having to push it. So us, Databricks as a vendor, we don't have to go tell people, please integrate with Databricks. The open source technology that we contribute to, automatically people are integrating with it. Delta Lake has integrations with lots of different software out there and Databricks as a company don't, doesn't have to push that. So I think open source is also another thing that really helps with the ecosystem integrations. Many of these companies in this data space actually have employees that are full-time dedicated to make sure make sure our software works well with Spark, make sure our software works well with Delta, and they contribute back to that community. And that's the way you get this sort of ecosystem to further sort of uh, flourish. Well, I really appreciate your time. And I, my final question for you is, you know, as we're trying to unpack and, and kind of shape and frame SuperCloud um, for the future, um, how would you see a roadmap or architecture or outcome for companies that are going to clearly be in the cloud where it's open source is going to be dominating. Integration has got to be seamless and frictionless. Abstraction layers make things super easy and, and, and take away the complexity. What is super cloud to them? What does the outcome look like? How, do you, how would you define a super cloud environment for an enterprise? Yeah, for me, it's the simplification that you get where you standardize an open source, you get your data in one place, in one format, in one standardized way, and then you can get your insights from it without having to buy lots of different idiosyncratic proprietary software from different vendors that's different in each environment. So it's this slow standardization that's happening. And I think it's going to happen faster than we think. And I think in a couple of years, it's going to be a requirement that, you know, yeah. does your software work on all these different environments? Is it based on open source? Is it using this data lake house pattern? And if it's not, I think they're going to demand it. Yeah, I feel like we're close to some sort of de facto standard coming and you guys are a big part of it. Once that clicks in, it's going to highly accelerate um, in the open, and I think it's going to be super valuable. Uh, Ali, thank you so much for your time, and congratulations to you and your team. Uh, continue. We've been following you guys since the beginning, remember the early days, and look how far it's come. And again, you guys are really making a big difference and making a super cool environment out there. Thanks for coming on, sharing. Thank you so much, John. Okay, this is SuperCloud 22. I'm John Furrier. Stay with us more for more coverage and more commentary after this break. Mm -hmm.